to go through each mycotoxin in turn. Ciarelinone. It's a non-steroidal, estrogenic, meaning it causes the release of estrogen, mycotoxin produced by some members of the Fusarium species. Studies have found no direct toxic or carcinogenic properties of ziorelinone in pigs, rats, or mice. Now, there is some tumor growth in extremely high doses, but this has been found to be related to the estrogenic effect of the mycotoxin. High levels of estrogen are known to cause cancer. Safe levels of the mycotoxin have been established by the World Health Organization, and you have little cause for concern if you do not regularly eat moldy foods. Patulin. This is a possibly harmful mycotoxin produced by members of the penicillin species found in fruits, particularly apples. It's not a particularly potent mycotoxin, and it was actually initially studied as a potential antibiotic. Now, carcinogenicity studies are negative or inconclusive, though it may cause damage to DNA in extremely high doses. But safe levels of the mycotoxin have been established by the World Health Organization, and you have little cause for concern if you do not regularly eat moldy foods. Aflatoxin. Now this is the dangerous one. It's a toxic and carcinogenic mycotoxin produced by members of the Aspergillus species. Chronic exposure has been implicated in liver cancers, and acute toxicity can also cause liver necrosis and cirrhosis. Interestingly, vaccination against hepatitis B, the other major player in liver cancer, may have a significantly protective effect against aflatoxin toxicity. But again, safe levels of the mycotoxin have been established by the FDA, and you have little cause for concern if you do not regularly eat moldy foods. So in case you missed it, the take-home message is don't eat moldy food. And I don't think you really need to be told that. I see those molds, that is the, the mycotoxins that they make, not the mold, growing mold itself. But the mycotoxins they make are dreadfully toxic, and I always see them in cancer patients right in the tumor. I'm not sure what the significance of that is, but when you find it's a common denominator for tumors, it does make you think it's important. Yeah, absolutely it would. That is, it would if the mycotoxins were consistently found in tumor cells. And they're not. And where does the patulin mold come from? Patulin is found in other fruits and, and plant materials too, but apples is where we get most of it. You can hardly peel an apple without seeing some mold under the peeling, and that will have patulin in it. Is that what we see in the brown spot? Yes. That's what the brown spot is. It isn't really a brown spot. It's a moldy spot. As an apple decays, a number of fungi might be acting upon it, but only the penicillin species would produce patulin. It's little cause for concern if there's a spot. If it really bothers you, just cut it out. But interestingly, apples naturally turn brown after exposure to air, as chemicals in the fruit react with oxygen to form melanin. And, of course, this is not at all toxic. How do you suggest we prepare our fruit, and how, do, how should we eat it? Mostly don't eat it. Don't eat fruits? Wow, that could be some of the worst medical advice I've ever heard. She wants you to lose the known benefits of a diet high in fruits because of her ludicrous claims of mycotoxins causing cancer. That statement is borderline criminal. Of course, that's what happens when you get medical advice from a loony zoologist. And I mean no offense to actual zoologists. What's your concern with the relationship with the pet and, and the sick patient? Pet dander and pet saliva and, and, and pet filth gets into everything in the room. I have tested dust from, from the room of a, of a home where there was a pet, let's say just a cat, much as I love cats. Yeah, who would have guessed she liked cats? <laughs> And there are ascaris eggs everywhere, and tapeworm eggs everywhere, on the tabletop, on the kitchen counter, on the chairs, anywhere you want to take a dust sample. Okay, we have here another complicated graph from the CDC showing the ascaris lumbricoides life cycle. Now to summarize it and put it simply, Ascaris lumbricoides, the roundworm that infects 1.5 billion humans worldwide, does not infect domestic animals. So domestic animals are incapable of infecting humans with Ascaris eggs. Now some worm infections can be zoonotic, meaning they can be transferred from animals to humans. So for the sake of completeness, I feel I should mention toxocariasis. 
This is caused by Toxocara canis and to a lesser extent by Toxocara cati. Now this is referred to as dog and cat roundworm. Now risk factors for this disease include exposure to pre-wormed puppies or interestingly geophagia which a surprisingly large number of small children practice habitually. But to suggest that every domesticated animal carries a roundworm infection is absolutely ludicrous. If your pet is neither a lactating female or a puppy, you have no cause for concern for infection from the Toxicara species. And why wouldn't there be? Our dander is everywhere, and our germs are everywhere. Why wouldn't theirs be? And what do these two parasites do to the body? They are very injurious. Ascaris does some of the most damaging things to us, causes our seizures, causes our uh, very many brain disorders. Actually, Ascaris infection usually has no clinical signs. An extremely high worm burden could cause intestinal obstruction or abdominal pain, and migrating worms could cause localized problems. But once again, Holda Clark's claims are as fake as her wig. As a note, several anecdotes from patients claiming miraculous cures by Holda Clark have been cut. We are always exceedingly happy when an illness is resolved, regardless of the cause, but we refuse to be complicit in the exploitation of their diseases to prop up ludicrous claims. Numerous explanations of miraculous cures abound, especially the placebo effect, but we deal solely with evidence. A currency Holda Clark's cures are lacking. Now you're a clinical dietitian. Yes, now I work with my husband in his office and we follow Dr. Clark's protocol. Who is Valeria Panfili? She's the wife of Dr. Adolfo Panfili, who will be discussed later, and her lack of medical degree enables her to make outrageous, unproved claims. And before you get upset, those are her words, not ours, as you'll soon see. Now, more information may possibly exist, but we don't speak Italian. And we're sorry. We blame our monoglot culture. So, all the way over here in Italy, you're following Dr. Clark's protocol. Why are you using her specific protocol? Well, we've used a lot of protocols. Uh, uh, my husband is doing orthomolecular medicine here in Italy. He's the president of the International Association for Orthomolecular Medicine here. And we've seen many kind of medicines. Uh, he knows Ayurvedic medicine, Tibetan medicine, and uh, vitamins, minerals, uh, amino acids, of course, all those kind of things. Uh, vitamin C from Linus Pauling, teachings, and everything. And lately, we've discovered Dr. Clark's protocol, and we've seen that it's very, very effective. So basically, they practice a wide range of complementary alternative medicines, which is fine. That they chose to adopt Holda Clark's protocol does not speak highly of their practice, however. Now the next clip is Valeria's husband. You might notice how his testimonial is markedly more reserved than his wife's. You might also note he barely talks about Holda Clark's protocol. We are helping people to heal by cancer. Who is Dr. Adolfo Panfili? 